Our scripture reading today is from Philippians chapters 3, verses 1 through 11. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, who we serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ is my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, know the power of his resurrection and participation in his, in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Thank you. I know what you're thinking. Eleven verses, it's hot in here. Is he going to talk about all those? Don't worry. This is part two of this series on Philippians chapter three. And if you're interested in part one, it's available on our church's YouTube page. In that first part on this series on downsizing, we talked about the effects on our brain on a regular practice of rejoicing in the Lord and how it can affect us. We reflected on the air and putting our confidences in earthly things. And we discussed our chances at fulfillment when we carry around our hopes and dreams in a wet paper sack. And what happens when we put our confidences in the flesh? Now having confidence one in oneself is a tricky thing. We live in an era where we're told we can do anything we put our mind to. We're taught to never give up. And with enough hard work, we can do and have anything we want. In this world that we have uh, instant gratification, whether it's getting information in seconds off the internet, or having something we order in two days or less, we've trained our brains to think that we can have what we want and when we want it. And if we see someone with something better than us, well, we can have that too, ASAP. And if our neighbor appears to be doing better than us, then we must do something to one-up them. Keeping up with the Joneses, the old saying goes. Well, I was interested in finding out just where that saying originated from, keeping up with the Joneses. So guess what? I got the info instantly over the internet. <laughs> the phrase originates with the comic strip, keeping up with the Joneses. And it was created by Arthur R. Momad in 1913 and the strip ran until 1940 in the New York world and a bunch of other newspapers too. Now the strip uh, depicts the social climbing McGinnis family who struggle to keep up with their neighbors, the Joneses. The Joneses, the Joneses are unseen characters throughout the strip's run. They're often spoken of but never actually seen. The idiom, keeping up with the Joneses, has remained popular long after the strip's end. I was surprised when I read that information, but it came off the internet, so it must be true. The saying could read, keeping up with Paul, though. Keeping up with Paul. After all, our author today of our scriptures did a lot for someone to keep up with. Now we left off in part one of this series with verse three from Philippians. So let's rejoin Paul in verse four, if you could bring verse four up. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Now the confidence Paul's referring to when he says, though I myself have reasons, for such confidence 
is from verse 3, confidence in the flesh. So Paul is saying he could have confidence in himself. Ha! How does that make you feel when you hear Paul making such a claim? When you hear Paul or when you hear anyone speak in such high regard for themselves, how does it make you feel? For some, you may be competitive. You may think, oh yeah, I'll show you who's great. For others, you may feel offended. Who does this person think they are? Or maybe feel challenged. I've got to beat this person. I've got to show them who's better. You may even feel confident. They have no idea just how good I am. Now, if that's the case, you probably feel anxious for your chance to talk, thinking, man, just wait until they hear what I have to say. In fact, you're probably so anxious to talk, you're thinking more about what you're going to say than listening to them. You ever catch yourself doing that? Keeping up with the Joneses. What's been your experience in trying that? Or seeing others attempt it? Imagine attempting to be or appear better than Paul. Verse 4 went on to say, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I remember myself being about junior high age, I would say, maybe 7th grade or so, and I was going to be better than my dad at basketball. Sure, he probably threw a few of the games when I was a grade schooler. But now, we had a real competition going on playing horse in our driveway. And I was determined to get the best of him. To be better. To show my skills. So every day after school, I was out in the driveway practicing my shots. I had my free throws down. I was lethal at those side shots. And I even had a secret backwards, no look shot I was waiting to unleash on old dad. I had practice and practice. And now the time had come. Dad just rolled in from work and I challenged him to a game of horse. He responded with something like, are you sure? Well, the dad in me now tells me that he probably asked this because he was tired from work and he probably didn't really want to play at that time. But at the time I thought, ha, I'm going to show him up. Today is my day. Well, I should, have, I should have taken that first shot because I never got a chance to show anything off. My dad walked right up to me, grabbed the ball, and then he proceeded to walk the length of the driveway leave the driveway, and stand in the street. He turned, faced the basket, which was all the way back, connected to the house above our garage, and proceeded to sink four straight shots without even touching the rim. Believe it or not, the net actually fell off the rim on the fourth shot. My mouth hung open with astonishment as he walked up to me, handed me the ball, and went into the house. <laughs> Needless to say, I went back to practicing. Now those infamous four shots turned into folklore in our family that are obviously still told today. Now Paul, he had done a lot more than sink some basketball shots. And he summarizes some of these things in verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. Paul gives this quick highlight reel to show the reasons he could boast. Everything listed were boastful descriptions in Paul's time. What's been your experience with boasting? It's certainly different when we're the ones boasting versus listening to someone else do it. When you hear others doing it, what are you feeling? You may be interested in what they have to say, or you may be bored thinking, man, is this ever going to end? Hopefully you're not thinking that right now. 
Or you might get nervous. Do you ever find yourself feeling anxious when you're around someone with so many listable accomplishments? You tend to start feeling inferior. Others have done so much that when we compare ourselves to them, we feel less. Does comparing yourself to what someone else has or how someone else talks or how talented they seem or how good they look or how good they dress cause you to feel anxious or inferior? If you've ever felt that way, did you want to go buy something? Or to do something to appear better than that person? Imagine for a moment the average commercial that you see or advertisement. What's the typical strategies that the marketers use? Usually they show you how much better your life could be or how much better you could look if you just buy this product. Just go on that trip. Take this magic pill and all your dreams will come true. Remember, we've talked about in the past, the only pill that really works is the gospel. Most of us, at one time or another, have done something to improve ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we all want to have the goal of being a better Christian. However, along the way, that desire to keep up with the Joneses can stall our Christian progression and tends to be more about upgrading our appearance to others. Do you catch yourself comparing yourself to others? Sometimes the person you're trying to one-up isn't even a real person. Just like in that original comic strip, the Joneses were never actually shown. Have you found yourself trying to beat a fictitious Joneses? One of the issues we face in an era of social media is we're bombarded with false advertisement. False because we have so much access to watching others' lives based on what they present on social media. Wow, look at so-and-so. They're on the perfect vacation. Or wow, look at them. They have the perfect family. Or wow, look at them. They have the perfect hair. Teeth, kids, car, job, life. When we're constantly seeing people's highlight reels only, we tend to forget that they're real people facing the same real life problems that every one of us face. So then we try to make our life as good as theirs appears to be. So we buy that thing. We take that trip. We whiten our teeth. We gel our hair. We buy that pill. We consume and consume in hopes of getting that fulfillment that others appear to have. Appear to have. When we put our confidences in the flesh, or earthly things as scripture tells us, it's like if we upgrade from using a wet paper sack to a plastic sack. We think that we're good to go. Have you ever put your confidence in a plastic sack? Let me rephrase that. Have you ever put your confidence in a Walmart plastic sack? <laughs> you can always think of distinct changing, a changing point in your life. I can think of a distinct time when Walmart switched to those sacks that they have now. Right? When we upgrade to a plastic sack, when we spend tons of time and even more money making that next purchase to improve our life, it will not last. What happens when you put that plastic sack in the heat? When you put it to the test? Or try putting some sand in it? Or try some liquid in it? Better yet, overload it and see what happens. Does life test you? Has life tested you? Is life testing you? Have you been left out in the sun? 
too long? Do you have to carry a larger load than you're built to carry on your own? Here's the good news. We don't have to carry that load alone. Darn it if we don't try, though. We're determined people here in the Dakotas, aren't we? If I've learned anything about history, it's that humans can accomplish some pretty big things. Us here in the Midwest are definitely determined. How else could we endure such long winters only to get to humid summers full of mosquitoes? When we go after something, we go after it. Like the landmark out here says, get her done. We get it done. So did Paul. He got it done. In verse 6, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteous, righteousness, based on the law, faultless. Paul was full of zeal. He was full of righteousness. Chances are you're full of one or both of those, too. Chances are also good that in one way or another you found yourself trying to keep up with the Joneses. And we've taken our zeal and our can-do attitudes and we've used it to acquire things that, our com that those commercials showed us would make our life so great. Paper sacks were once the way to go. Then we found some flaws, like when they get wet. So we invested in plastic sacks. We've put our confidences in so many places. So many places. We put our zeal towards so many things, only to find out two things. Number one, the Joneses keep getting one more thing than us. Or there's always someone else doing something more. There's always someone better, it seems. Number two, we aren't any better than we were before we put our belief in that plastic sack. We've learned that regardless of what we do, someone else is always doing better or has more. Know this, to someone else, you are that person. To someone else, you are the one that they are envious of. And when, is that, when that's the case, we know better, don't we? Someone else is envious of us, but we know better. We know that they shouldn't be putting their confidences in us, because we know that about ourselves. We'll also know that when we are the ones trying to keep up with others, it's the same way. God lets us fail, doesn't he? And we do. And we do whenever we put our efforts towards earthly desires. God is all we need. God is all we need. Let's pray. Dear God, you've given us the wonderful ability to fail. We often spend a lot of time and energy on things that really just don't matter. God, we just we pray for your guidance. We pray for the wisdom and courage to put our confidences in you. <clears throat> God, help us to stop repeating that endless cycle of going down the wrong roads. Lord, help us to understand that you are all we need. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for our hymn, More and More About Jesus. And it's on your insert, and we'll do verses 1, 2, and 3.
It's cool downstairs and there's food. Yes. I've been asked to tell everyone that uh, apparently the food supply is an asshole. Uh, everyone is welcome to join us uh, downstairs. Please join us. The third piece of good news is there's a lot of food downstairs. <laughs> so please, please come down. May the Lord continue to bless you and be with you as you go forward. Go forward with the confidence knowing that everywhere you go, God is with you. Amen. Our hymn of parting can be found on page 701.